uh, is distributed according to the presence of the Japanese companies in the uh, India, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Haryana, Maharashtra, Rajasthan, Gujarat, and Uttar Pradesh. And what we are discussing with uh, the uh, uh, government, this is just a broad suggestion uh, from Japanese side. Um, because the uh, export market is very important uh, in terms of the, their uh, untapped market and in terms of the providing uh, Japanese relatively new companies in here in India a market. Uh, so domestic market is not enough for the new companies. So export is very important. In this context, we are discussing about the SEZ uh, issues. And the uh, operational cost uh, is important factors. So whatever measures which can contribute to reduce the operational cost, of course, they are welcomed, uh, CST and other taxes. And of course, the initial fixed cost uh, is, is especially important for SMEs uh, because the, uh, in order to make profit as early as much possible, uh, reducing the initial uh, cost, fixed cost, is very important. In, in, in this context, we are discussing about the rental factory. This is a kind of a ready-made factories, just a plug-in, so the companies immediately can start their operation using by these ready-made uh, facilities, uh, which has already been introduced in other ASEAN countries. And also, another operational problem is daily uh, the operational issues rises daily basis so if there are any framework uh, to help resolve those operational issues that would be helpful uh, which means the pro project facilitation committee at the last line so this is the example of the uh, project facilitation committee in Karnataka state JETRO is organizing the Japanese investors and uh, state government meeting and at, that, at that meeting, JETRO invites the Japanese companies and they express their uh, issues, challenges. And then from the Karnataka side, uh, the industrial commissioner, uh, he chaired the meeting. And all relevant ministries uh, like infrastructure, uh, the human resources, whatever, uh, those relevant ministries from Karnataka also are present. And um, we are discussed about a quick uh, resolution under the leadership of the Industrial Commissioner of uh, Karnataka State. So this works very well and uh, highly appreciated by the Japanese industry in Karnataka. So those kind of a quick action resolution mechanisms is very uh, appreciated. And the last slide, uh, this is about a little bit of broad area. Uh, JETRO is also oh, helping the RCEP in negotiation process. Of course, the Middle East and Africa is traditionally Indian partnership, but now the look east, act east side is becoming more important. I quote the electronic company's comment, the typical process of investment is starting from import, then uh, local uh, assembly or manufacturing, and more procurement locally, localization, and then finally export. In this context, uh, the being connected to the e Asian markets are very useful for Japanese industries and RCEP will contribute to further uh, promotion of FDI from Japan. And uh, now I think it's a time to India to leverage more uh, from the e ASEAN and Chinese market. So this is a, a <coughs> very brief uh, introduction of JETRO and METI's activity. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Abhisan. I think uh, there's some significant uh, points that you have made based on uh, the data. Particularly striking, I think, is the, the fact that the number of SMEs from Japan in India is lower compared to Thailand uh, and China. I th and I think that deserves uh, much more attention, in both in terms of, of research uh, as well uh, as in terms of actual implementations, because as we know, SMEs can have significant spillover benefits, not only in terms of innovation, but also in terms of creating employment, which India sorely needs. So I think 
SME interaction in India uh, deserves much more attention. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Konishi san, who is the managing director of Sojits India Private Limited uh, from 2012, which is a subsidiary of Sojits Corporation, the Japanese Sogo Sosha. And uh, Konishi san will be speaking on India's business environment. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to express my sincere thanks uh, to inquirers and the uh, staff who are involved for the preparation of this conference. Uh, my presentation will be uh, divided two parts. Uh, one is uh, uh, the president of JCCII, and uh, I will explain what JCCII is and what our activities are. Second, as a managing director of Sojis India, uh, I will speak on the collaboration for Indian infrastructure development by Japan and on Sojis itself, in particular in railway sectors. Uh, what is JCCI? Uh, JCCI, which stands for Japan Chamber of Commerce and Industry in India, is mainly comprised of Japanese companies in India, in Delhi and the suburban areas. Uh, the organization was formed early on, but uh, in order to be more effective, uh, we were incorporated in July 2006. The number of members in JCCII has increased steadily, and uh, we now have up to 401 companies as of October 2015. Uh, our activities are based in dairies and suburban areas. There are other JCCII related organizations in Mumbai, and Bangalore, and Chennai, and Kolkata. So this diagram shows that the business locations are dispersed from north and to south and we place importance on communications and sharing information with each other. So <coughs> this chart shows the uh, number of Japanese companies and uh, Japanese re residents in India from 2005 up to October 2014. And uh, as you can see, uh, within 10 years, there was a five-fold increase in the number of Japanese companies and a four-fold increase in the number of Japanese residents. The last bilateral summit between India and Japan held in September 2014 has set a target of doubling the num number of Japanese companies in India within five years as an objective to be jointly achieved. Uh, it is a very challenging target. However, I believe it is achievable if we work together with the Indian government in proactively solving obstacles facing Japanese companies. Uh, as India presents a vast potential for investment, uh, Japanese companies have assessed the merits of in investment in India. As you can see in this diagram, uh, it is very clear that uh, most companies feel that uh, India has significant market size and growth potentials. So, according to the survey of JVIC, uh, uh, Jap Japan Bank of International Corporation last year, India became the number one countries considered by Japanese companies for promising investment in the short term. At the same time, risks of in investment in India were also considered. Uh, there are the main concerns, the complexity of the system and tax procedures, and development infrastructures, complexity of government procedures and underdeveloped 
and uh, opaque operation of legal systems. In order to solve these problems and issues, JCCII began the initiative of submitting suggestions, uh, le submissions letters to the Indian government with the help of the Embassy of Japan in India. So suggestion letters have been submitted to the government of India uh, since 2009. And our primary objectives is to solve problems and issues we face. Uh, we believe the suggestions can improve the business environment, attract investment, and into, into, introduce Japanese skills and technologies uh, in India, which would then, uh, we would then create new jobs. Furthermore, we do this with the intention of contributing to the development of the Indian economies. To give you a better understanding of uh, how the uh, letters works, I will show you the 2015 suggestion letters. Uh, since time is limited, I will highlight uh, the issue where uh, which was. This is the tax systems and the financial sectors, logistics, steel products, uh, Japan lawyers, and intellectual property rights, uh, procedure SME, and infrastructures, uh, hold up items. So uh, today we have, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Mr. Sin from the DAPP. So the uh, as a, you know coordination of the uh, those uh, uh, suggestions, uh, they are uh, supporting JCCI uh, very much. So I'd like to companies to have a satisfying work uh, environment and experience in India. Uh, when the number of satisfied companies increase, it automatically attracts new investors to this market. Now I'd like to focus on infrastructure development in India. So this is a development plan for infrastructure by government of India. So Prime Minister Modi allocated uh, 3.1 lakh uh, Indian rupees, uh, 3.1 lakh crores rupees, which is increase of 70, uh, 70,000 crores from 2014. Uh, this makes up 70% of the government uh, total budget. The government is also promoting new policies for infrastructures. I believe uh, this budget shows the government government is dedicated to the improvement of infrastructure in India. So the Japanese government has also announced their aggressive assistance for the improvement of infrastructure in India. As you may know, both India and Japan declared the Tokyo announcement uh, the Japan India Special Strategic and Global Partnership. In this, uh, Prime Minister Abe announced a uh, 3.5 trillion J Japanese yen investment during five years by the government and by private sectors. I believe most of the most of this amount will be allocated to the infrastructures programs. From now on, I will focus on the railway field, where Sojit has been actively working in India. The total truck length of the Indian railway is 64,406 uh, 64, kilometers. Uh, that is the fourth largest in the world. Please refer to the uh, green chart. Uh, this is the number of passengers much by the uh, distance of each passenger 
to give a scale indicators for railway for passengers. India is the largest in the world. That means that a big number of passengers covers great distances, indicating that the railway is a national fundamental infrastructure in India. The budget in Indian railways is uh, 1 lakh uh, crores, which is 50% up from 2014. In addition to this, the investment of 8.5 lakh crore over the, uh, over the duration of five years. Such a substantial investment hasn't been made before, and yet it is still not enough for the change required in India railway. Hence, Indian railway would like to utilize private funds, and this brings us to the following point. Encouraging private pa participation in Indian railway sectors. The first question I'd like us to consider is, regardless of whether the funding source is from the government or the private sectors, what is the final target? What is the final goal? The answer is to develop the rail infrastructures, which should be the base of industrial development and people's lives. This is the correct answer, which I'm sure no one has doubt about. My second question is, why are private companies' participation required? If your answer is because Indian Railway does not have enough fund for the project, or Indian Railway want to utilize private financial strengths, this doesn't quite hit the mark. You need to add the following. In order to have better infrastructures, Indian Railway will utilize the private sector technologies, methodologies, operation, and maintenance, even with higher costs. This change of mindset on this part of the Indian Railway is very important. If Indian Railway want to attract private companies to this market. As of today, we cannot say that IR can su succeed in inviting private companies to this industry because of various issues. If we cannot attract private companies, in other words, if we discourage private companies, IR won't have enough opportunity to acquire better technology and methodologies, and we therefore cannot expect improvement in IR's own technology and methodologies. This is a big loss for Indian other countries. IR need to attract private companies by changing their mindset. Uh, once private companies enter these industries, IR can learn better technology and the methodologies, and in the future, IR's own technology would improve. IR need to give serious consideration towards how they can establish this win-win relationship. So in order to concrete, uh, create a win-win situation with private companies, these are some suggested do's and don't do for the IR. Number one, please do not abandon private companies to face risks they cannot handle on their own. IR should protect private companies from the various risks that IR should ordinarily have taken care of themselves. Second, fair competition. Grant shall, uh, comp fair competition grant shall be prepared. And number three, 
please consider the private companies who try to invest in, the, in these areas as a client of IR. Please do not view them as vendors. Please understand that just as the IR choose a private partners, the private companies also choose the countries. India is competing against China's or other Asian countries, the Middle East, etc. Since private companies are clients, please think about how to help private companies generate profit. So this is immense potential for investment in India. And Japan is one country that is eager to take this step. We currently urge India to seriously consider making change, especially in their way of thinking, so that both our countries can proudly play a successful role in helping India, India reach their full potentials. So, I will shortly touch on the uh, DFC project for which Sojits has been jointly working with uh, Rasan Tubros. That is the uh, DFC's uh, project ongoing. So, Actually, I wanted to show the uh, progress of the uh, work photos, but uh, sorry, I couldn't. Oh, it's coming. <coughs> uh, this is, uh, all of these photos were taken around uh, Bage Bagega Depot. Uh, Bagega Depot is uh, located in Rajasthan, and it is two hours drive from Jaipur. Uh, to, uh, yes, down left, this is a rail uh, storage areas, and uh, down right, this is a sleeper storage. Uh, in this project, uh, 2.4 million sleepers are required. And at the Bagega depot, max production of sleepers are 2,000 sleepers per day. So, this is just for your reference, so this next target in India. So we would like to contribute uh, to the further development of railway in infrastructure in India. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Konishi-san, for uh, those uh, comments and remarks, and especially on what uh, is India in terms of doing business. All of you must have seen the recent uh, doing business report from the World Bank which India has jumped up 12 paces from 142 to 130 so there's some improvement uh, they, but a lot more needs to be done and that if you kind of deconstruct that improvement a lot of that has happened due to uh, improvements in electricity connections power uh, sector and you know, if I can quote Ikria's research, and Professor Hoda is sitting here, and some of his research shows that when you go and survey companies, uh, and you ask them about the challenges of doing business in India, you know, availability of power always comes out to be one of the foremost challenges uh, of, of doing business in India. So there's some improvement in, in the power situation, which is reflected in the doing business indicators. And uh, as DIPP has said, uh, I don't know whether it's the official position, but certainly the Secretary has said that we wish to be in the top 50 soon, and I hope, inshallah, that target is met. We are actually uh, running out of time, uh, but it will be a shame not to allow some interaction from the floor. So there are a limited number of questions, and I will then invite the panelists to, to respond to the questions that you may have. So please be brief, identify yourself, uh, and uh, we'll have the mic uh, come to you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bohidar. Uh, one of my first cars was the Maruti Suzuki. And um, 
Uh, Mr. Bargan is not here, but I give credit to the Japanese for creating what I call the Indian middle class. Uh, because of that investment in 1982, 83, we happened to liberalize in 92, 93, and uh, things have been going well. Uh, but my question is to Ms. Singh. Ma'am, you brought up a concept called uh, good living conditions with Japanese ambience. Um, I, I work on an area called locality, which is global investment in local communities, you know, creating local places. And uh, uh, Konishi uh, San said something about industrial environment. Could you give us a little idea of why the Japanese environmental or community environment and ambience should impact that or should it not? And how is this distinct from what you said? India's lack of experience with the Western Industrial Revolution. You know, a little bit of an idea about the architecture, you know, perhaps discipline, various things that impact each other. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Are there any other questions? Please go ahead. Just a small clarification from Mr. Rab. Uh, you want Indian government to prohibit uh, illegal migration. What is that illegal migration you're talking about? Are there, are there, there's a question back there. I think we'll have to take care of the air quality as well. Okay, air quality. Right, any other questions before I turn back to the panelists? Okay, so let me turn to the panelists in reverse order now. Uh, Konishi-san, would you like to respond uh, to the question about townships? You had also industrial townships with the Japanese ambience? I know uh, Mrs. Singh had mentioned. Uh, would you like to comment on it? So, uh, especially, so, uh, uh, Mr. Abeson said also the, uh, I also explained this, some of the uh, hurdles or difficulties for the Japanese companies. And uh, the uh, now the uh, I think the many of, you know Japanese uh, large scale of company uh, here in India, and now uh, the number of the SME uh, uh, getting uh, increasing, and uh, we are expecting or more you know the company from uh, Japan, uh, the special SME. 